Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Breno. Uh, I work at Meta. I've been working with uh, Live Patch with Thong and Yang Hong Sun, who is going to talk after me. And uh, we decided to submit this presentation to expose some of the problems we have today and try to figure out like a solution at upstream so we don't need to have custom patches. So at Meta today, we have some custom patches to do what we need to do, and that's what I'm going to expose. And it, they're custom, and how do we figure out together as a community uh, how to upstream those patches? I've been talking to some other folks, kind of almost all of them have the same problem. So I think it's a good time, uh, good time to use this conference to discuss like what can we do as a community to fix some of those uh, problems. Anyway, uh, I'm going to give uh, an introduction on how do we use Live Patch, how we are monitoring it, and some of the challenges. And feel free to stop us at any time to discuss uh, if you think that doesn't make sense or if you have some ideas on how we can do it better. Yeah, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, yeah, so what we know is that at Meta, installing a kernel is super slow. So if you have one machine, it's going to take maybe a few minutes to install a new kernel. Uh, at Meta, at this scale we have, it's super hard. So we have what we call uh, box cars, and we split the data centers into maybe 50, uh, what we call MSB. And almost every day, there is a train that goes there, and drains the machines, install a new kernel, does firmware upgrade, drain, uh, drain the machine, store the kernel, firmware upgrade, whatever, and undrain the machine and the machine is serving traffic again. So if you need to install a new kernel after that, you need to wait for the train to go to all the MSBs and come back to that. So it takes like sometimes 45 days to install a kernel. So that's kind of the problem that motivated KLP to be used. And uh, yeah, so that, that's why we are using KLP in the first thing. The second problem is when we are rolling out a new kernel, so let's suppose we start rolling out 6.6, .6, and we start rolling out to some tiers, like we have a few tiers like RC, meaning that if we break, if we have some memory corruption, that's kind of okay. And then we go to other tiers up to the most important tiers. And sometimes if we have a problem, uh, we need to restart with a new kernel, with a new fix, and that, that slow things down. So we also use KLP to speed up that one. So we don't need to stop and restart. We basically fix that and continue the rollout. So that's the case too that we use it. Any questions so far? Oh, perfect. So that's the motivation for a KLP. The way we run KLP or the one we, the way we roll out KLP is we have several phases. Basically we have an RPM and we have several phases. So we split the whole servers into 23 phases right now. We deploy to the first one. And remember, this is for a KLP, not for a kernel. We install in the first shard. We, we have a bake time, what we call for four hours. And then we are measuring those machines and compare those machines with the one without the KLP and making sure that this is as good as the previous version. If it is as good as the previous version, we go to the next step and next step. Uh, four days later, we were able to roll out the KLP fleet wide. Of course, that we can speed up if we are having problems, but the trade-off is we, we are not getting a lot of metrics. So we are, uh, uh, we have a little bit higher risk. And we do cumulative KLP. So we just have basically one KLP applied. If we need a second one, we are going to append the fix for the first one plus the fix for the second one and roll out that one. So basically, if you SSH into any machine in the fleet, basically one and only one KLP is applied. Yeah, so that's the, the rollout mechanism. Uh, this is a screenshot of our, our tool. Uh, how long does it take? Uh, 23 phases. And that's what we control. So if there is any metric, and that's, that's where I want to start uh, changing the presentation to. Yeah, just, just, just get the, the, the box. So when you say a phase, is that just a subset of the nodes that you're trying to find? Exactly, we call that shard. 
and there are a set of machines that is on that shard. So the RPM is just installed on those sh on that shard. We bake time, we compare that with the previous version, and if everything is good, we, we so mark it as green. The, the process you described earlier of actual deployment of the kernel itself, not the light patch, you said it took 45 days, mm -hmm. and the train was well, a single train that went through your fleet. Right. Why don't you shard that as well and have parallel trains leaving for a subset of uh, nodes that you want to update? That's a good question because we use different systems for different rollouts. For kernel, we use a different system that we can talk more later, but we basically go in a different way. We start per region instead of like fleet wide. Why don't we do that for KLP? Because sometimes that region does not have the kernel we are fixing. For instance, we we, let's suppose we have region one that contains a new kernel, kernel 6.6, .6, and we are KLP kernel 6.5. We cannot use that. We need to find hosts in the fleet that has 6.5. So uh, as you start rolling out the KLP, let's say you discovered another bug. Okay. Right? And you have a, a new live patch that you would accumulate into the current patch that's rolling. Mm -hmm. Do you reset the rollout and start the first node or you just leave the first node running that potentially buggy kernel and just proceed further with <sighs> The new car, new That's a good back. question. For KOP, we can roll back. It's easy roll to back. roll back, yeah. Okay. And restart. Cool. Okay, so that's the monitoring part, and that's where I'm starting to move the discussion towards because I think that's where uh, we have some of the problems. Again, so the, the rollout mechanism is we have a rollout manager, we have a package rollout, basically an RPM that goes to a shard, install an RPM, and the service health check that gives the information to the rollout manager, basically say, yeah, we are good so far, move to the next one, or stop the rollout because something is weird, we need a human to, to fix uh, this problem. Uh, and this is what we see. Uh, we have two kernels here, the blue one and green one. <laughs> so we need to know if the blue one is better than the green one. To, to make a decision. In this case, <laughs> anyway, uh, but my point here is uh, we use this kind of metrics for a lot of things. The first one is the kernel crash. That's easy, right? But we also want to know, is this kernel giving some warnings or bugs or is the performance bad for this kernel? And remember that we have metrics for a bunch of things. Is the web server performance as good in the KLP version compared to the standard version? So we have a bunch of those and we have a code that it needs to check off then. If everything is green, proceed, otherwise stop. So and is, are all the nodes here running the same workload or there's a diversity of workload that the nodes are running? diversity of workloads, but we get information for, for those workloads that are running that kernel. So for instance, let's suppose we have the same kernel database and web. So the metrics we have for web is just for the web servers. This is kind of consolidated in one uh, table that we can query. So yeah, for instance, another problem we have is uh, applications are crashing. So we have core dump and application crash. We report it to the database, say application X, like Nginx crashed. And we want to know, does it crash or did it crash on the KOP version or not? And sometimes, as you know, like things crash all the time. Like we want to know how many crashes do we have on this kernel compared to the other one. And we want to normalize that and compare. And, and that's where the challenges start to be. Uh, so now we, we need to start reporting what is the KOP version for that crash. Or for the web server, what is the performance for this web server? And we need to start reporting what is the KOP applied for this, uh, for this kernel that is running on this web server. And that's where I'm starting to, to move towards. Uh, we have this information from different places. And usually these different places mean different teams. And some of them are not even aware of KLP. They just care about like kernel. What is my kernel? 
and what are the disk latency for this kernel? What, what are the user space for this kernel? So that's, that's one of the challenges we have, that it's not easy to get the KOP version. So people can easily report that this is the kernel, this is the KOP. Uh, yeah, so, and we have, as I said, we have random teams producing this metric because the kernel team just wants to consume whatever people think is important. And remember that we are, when you're talking about web server, database, ads, like a bunch of things, and all of them now we need to have uh, the KLP version that is applied. And uh, challenge. So basically we have three of them. I'll just cover the first one and then I will transition to Song, who will cover the, the second and third one. So the first one is the one that I told you. How do we get the, uh, the KLP that is applied on that machine in different forms so I can report back to the data warehouse so we can consume later? And uh, it's not easy to get this KLP right now, mainly because we are consuming these from different places. And it's even harder to find if a KLP is applied. And you say, ah, it's easy. You just go to sys uh, live patch enabled. Well, but sometimes the kernel crashed. So we need to investigate the crash them to find if the, catch, the, the patch is applied. And that's the challenge we have. So challenge number one. So let's just start from the beginning. We, want, we have net console at Meta today. So every kernel message is pushed to net console. And we don't have KLP. So if you apply a patch, a KLP patch into the kernel, next console will report the same kernel version. So what do we need to do? This is ugly, but that's what we have in production. So we create a dictionary at print K that, uh, that creates the uname key and appends the uname with the hotfix. And at every KLP, we define a macro called HV hotfix version that is hotfix one. And in the print K, we append that to the print K dictionary that is going to populate that console. So at every KLP that we apply to a kernel, we change a macro that will change what is populated to, uh, to that console. So we all drive really so like do it in a live patching way. Uh, the problem with the unit is that there's only not much space. I have a slide for that. Okay, so I'll, I'll... <laughs> that, that's the ideal scenario, but I don't think it's feasible. But let's let's discuss that because that's uh that's an interesting thing. Anyway, net console is the first problem. Second problem, crash dump. So an application, a user space application crashed. No, I'm sorry, kernel crashed in this case. The kernel crashed, we have a, a VM core for the, for the kernel, and we need to investigate if the KLP is applied or not. And this is our code for production. So we need to figure out if the module is loaded or not. But remember, you can have the module loaded, but it's disabled. So there is no way for us to be sure that that KLP was really enabled. So we assume that if the module is loaded, the KLP was applied just because we don't have more information. So that's another way that I think we, we definitely want to improve. And in the third case, uh, we need to read C's kernel live patch and we have a function today to read that and, and, and parse is the enable, disable, whatever. But then we need to have like the same function or the same helper in different languages for all, for all the workloads to consume that. Some of them are in Rust, some of them are in C++, some of them are in Python. So kind of we need to replicate that because the way the kernel exposes that needs some parsing that is not ideal. So yeah, so that's the third problem, the least important one, but eventually we can, we, we can improve that. That would help us to uh, have a cleaner system. Anyway, so Next step, is this really a problem for other companies? And how do we fix that instead of playing whack-a-mole 
uh, with the KLP uh, today. I have some suggestions here, and the first one is exactly what SUSE is doing, uh, change UTS name to append. I'm not sure if it is feasible to do upstream. So do you want to share what you do at uh, SUSE, please? Uh, so originally we depended slash LP string and we did hash so it which points to our um, git repo with the bug fish so that we know whatever that's whatever we need, we know what we like what, what's running on the system. Uh -huh. uh, then preempt the dynamic uh, A and that A pull up space from from you. Now there was not only a preamp or preamp, there was a preamp dynamic, and there's only, I think, something like 64 bytes for the whole exactly, thing, yeah. which is not much. So we we remove we remove uh, the hash, we know we store it somewhere else in one version of what we put, and that's only that's only slash LP. But uh, honestly I I'm not sure if it's something we want in our stream because of this uh, Exactly. Take a look at if we can somehow enlarge QBS name. I'm not sure. Or maybe create a new field there. I know that this structure is shared with user space, yes. so I'm not sure it's easy or feasible. But if we can have like another place there. Uh, I just wonder if it would be enough to extend actually the information that is predicted by one of yeah yeah I, I think that would help and that's one of the approach i'm sorry so i have a question for susie fox it's just like I think like if you patch U name, like that's probably gonna change the behavior of other tools that it depends on U name. And one thing I think that's gonna break K patch, because P catch use U name dash R to decide where to find the patches. And if you patch that, uh, like that will change. So <laughs> like depend on if you have patch version one, like uh, you will find a different location. But that's one thing uh, I, I know, but I think there's other things that probably going to break if we, we do that. So I want to know, like, Susie's experience is something like uh, turns out to be fixable or... I, I, I would agree with you, but I think this specific issue here is where do we find the KPAT module to load? Um, interesting question. I, I hadn't thought about it because I think we, we were also worried about changing the new name, uh, disrupting user space parsing of it. Um, that might not expect the patch or a GitHub presence in your name. So it could be here that it's using For example, if you configure the kernel tree and you do a big uh, model install, does that unit name? Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry, I didn't Oh, there's a mic here as well. Oh. Just, okay. Yeah. So one hypothetical example would be if you do make modules install for a kernel, um, it installs it to lib modules, whatever, based on your name dash R, right? So if you have a live patch loaded and you make modules install, that would presumably put them in the wrong place. Yes, and I think that if we want to go towards that direction, probably we want to append a new field, and you name dash r is going to report the same release. But let's say you have you name dash l or k, and then it's dumped the 
the, the KLP. Or the other word, I think it's like changing the kernel you name in the fly might have some consequences that are hard to debug. Anyway, thanks for the insight. Second problem, uh, or second solution. As you said, maybe we can append that to, to warnings and bugs, or we can just append that to that console. We have like a dictionary, we can create this new dictionary, and we can append at every time that a KLP is loaded. That's not as ideal as the first one because that's just for kernel message, but that's a solution, maybe, eventually. And third, prob third proposed solution is we can create something like sys kernel live patch active modules that is easy to read. So you don't need to do the whack-a-mole loading off them and looking if they're enabled or not. Anyway, uh, anything here seems crazy enough? Like Just regarding, regarding the last one. Uh -huh. So I don't understand why those enabled attributes are not enough. So you don't really need active modules. So you just, you can go through go through enabled in that because, every patch. And yeah, that, that's what we do today, but we yeah. need to have the same thing all the places, like to parse the directory that, if we have something like that, I think it's easy to read from user space first. And second, I think it's easy to read from kernel crashes. You don't need to do this parsing all the time. Let's say you have three modules, one of them is loaded, the others are not. That's that's my thinking. Maybe I'm completely mistaken yeah. here. Uh, just just one remark. So we also had something similar. Uh, not not for modules. We had something for we had a list of patches which were which oh, functions which were live patched on a system that was kind of useful for us. It could not be in a sysfs because there's a rule for sysfs that uh, each attribute needs or has to have only only uh, integer value. So it's either one zero one or something like this. Uh, so we we had it in in a proc, uh, slash proc, mm -hmm. and but that had its own limits because I think it's limited just by four kilobytes. yeah four kilobytes. So just one just one page. Uh -huh. So we of course we got in the situation where the, the list of functions were was much longer. So it also didn't work for us much. Cool. Just saying. Uh, yeah, one thing that we actually uh, have some small script. That is able like to read the information from sys and just print the message. So I wonder if this might be a solution, like small tool to print might be called and just print the status. Yeah, and yeah. it might be called from the problem with that is like we cannot trust that too much because on the on the receiver side, then we need to keep state. So let's suppose you apply the module and then we remove it, apply the hotfix one, and then we move hotfix one, apply what fix two. On the others, and in the meantime, you have like a warning. So somehow here on the receiving side, you need to have state 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 that oh now you have hotfix one instead of hotfix two. And remember that we use NAC console, NAC console is UDP. We may miss back, we may miss messages. In this case, it's going to be like a total confusion. Uh, yeah, well, I I still from my point of view, uh, I, I think that it's overhead to append this information to all print car messages. And I, I, I still think that the best solution might be to add, add this to the warn mm -hmm. output because it's it's exactly there are these informations like loaded modules and a lot of stuff. So uh, in your experience, uh, at any given point in time, how many different life patches are making their way through your fleet? Uh, how many you mean? How many different live patches are making their way through the fleet? Making a way to the fleet, you mean? So if I have one uh, one version of the patch I apply to 100 servers, is this one or 100? <laughs> no, 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 what I mean is, you said you had uh, shards of this thing going on. Mm -hmm. And as you go along, halfway through, if you found a, found a bug, you would actually accumulate that life patch with the next patch. And so there could be distinct life patches currently making their way through the fleet. And uh, the problem that you're listening <coughs> here is because of that, right? After all, if only one life patch was making its way through the fleet, then you would know that. Uh, no, because you are comparing whatever is live patched with the pristine version of the kernel. 
So if you just have one, you want to compare this one against whatever was in the past to make sure that the version that you are hot fixing is not worse at least than the, the first version. All right, I still have the same question, which is how many different base versions do you need to compare this new one against? Let's take this offline. We just have four minutes right. and I think we still have like the yeah. whole song section. <laughs> okay, so a couple of things. And one thing like we know lab patch, uh, like thanks Steve makes the uh, F-trace trampling fast enough that we don't have to worry about it in most cases. It's just uh, work there. But when we have like uh, millions of servers, like uh, we got hammered for 1% performance drop. So we have to be very careful. So one thing is like, we, we keep getting asked, hey, you are patching this function. This is too hard that we're gonna see a regression. So sometimes we don't have a good answer. And like, it's no easy way to say for different application, like how often this function will be called. It's like, uh, if some a map or different things. Um, first of all, I don't know if did you ever <laughs> implement to F trace? I think we did. We switched to the F trace args yeah. instead of using the regs. Yeah. I mean, that should have made a, a significant impact improvement. So right now, uh, I don't know exactly what the full impact is. Should be too bad uh, because what happens now is it just jumps and then goes to your little thing and then jumps. So it's your little guy that needs to figure out what it is. I don't know if there's a way to shorten that. I don't know if. Uh, um, I mean, we could, there's a direct function call that BPF uses. I don't know if you want to use that. That would make things more complex, more or more difficult. I don't know. Um, the question is, if it's usually, I mean, how hot are the paths? And you guys easily set counters if you want to know how many times it's hit. Yeah, that's the point here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the point oh, yeah. is not that F-trace is not fast enough. It just it's like we won't have a vision or like a, a sense, like exactly how hot this is, right. like how much actual overhead, well, we can have an estimation like uh, 100 nanosecond to 50 nanosecond and we want the counter there so we can multiply that with the counter and have an estimation and easily tell someone show up and say, hey, I have a service. I think you have a lab patch. We got the performance regression, is this that? Mm -hmm. We say, okay, you get this. You get a, a million calls per second. That's like nothing for your like a 100 core system. Right. Now, so the funny part is adding the counter will actually add overhead too. But. That is true. <laughs> and, and that's the, exactly the point. View, like so. we can always use tracing, yeah. right? Like uh, everything is F trace, both functions. So we can always use tracing and the count there, but like the counter is cheaper than add yeah. another layer of oh, tracing. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, I'm saying it's, but I don't know if you want that counter, like, like, like have a static switch or something to enable it or disable it. So if you don't care about the counter, you shouldn't be countering if you don't care about the counter. Uh, yeah, that's all. Because usually, like I said, I, when to me, tracing or fly patching, to my point is you ideally want zero overhead. So any, sometimes I get overly micro optimizations, but still it's kind of like um, my view of tracing. And also I would say the, uh, the instrumentation of live patch is the same. It's a second class citizen to the kernel, which means that you basically do as much as you can to make it not impact what the kernel wants to do. So that's the only point I would say is yes, I would, I would do that. I, would, I mean, it's up to you guys. It's the counter for years. Code. Do you already have that, the counter? No. So you guys don't have the counter yet. So, I mean, the counter will just tell you how hot it is, but it's not going to tell you the overhead of it. Uh, well, I think the overhead of this actually yeah. depends on yeah. different architecture is really like and cash alignments. Yeah, yeah, I need to it's, have some estimation. I, I actually uh, put a bunch of uh, trace points inside the scheduler and checked the overhead and the uh, uh, hack bench improved. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> because uh, honestly, we never considered to, to measure any such thing because we knew that the overhead is really really small and with, especially with with the recent well, sort of recent changes so and it was like it's always a question of balance so i i don't think it's just so now you you tell me so you must have noticed it in your in your fleet so or, or not so uh, we we haven't been brave enough to patch like a hot function have a scheduler or things like that 
we pretty much every time we say, okay, this looks safe enough, and we just like sanity check, maybe with tracing, like just count how many times we do. Hey, and but I'll just, to the schedule, that could be a uh, kernel uh, scheduling plugins. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need SkinX, just a uh, hot patch. It. Go on. So I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's so. Uh, well, I, I think that actually uh, interpret uh, the counter is hard to do because it always depends uh, what the how what the function does. It might be huge function, and then the the, the uh, tracing stuff is negible but it might be really small function and then but the tracing stuff. I think, no, stuff I think the counter is might... good because what, the, what you would do, I would say, is you probably have a timestamp. So the counter, it's not just a counter of how many times hit, it's how many times per second, how many times per millisecond. Yeah. So yeah. if it's, the, the overhead is fixed. So even if it's a big, because uh, you really don't care, like, okay, yeah, this is a little guy, but it's only called a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, it might double the length of the function, but since it's only called three times, you don't care. Yeah. If it's a, but if it's a big function that's called millions of times, you'll notice the overhead on that one. So it's not the length of the function. It's I think the counter is actually the correct me measurement of okay. estimating how much this patch I did impacts the performance. Yeah. yeah. Can we disable and enable that in runtime, the counter, so we can do some sampling? That's what I said. I said with a static, you could do a, a, a static branch. Are you familiar with static branches? Uh, yeah, so uh, just for those that don't know static branches, it's basically a live patch of the actually a if statement. It's just a no, it's a no op or a jump. So that instead of having an if statement. So you could actually do a static branch of whether or not you enable the counter or not at runtime, but then, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, why, why not? Because it just could, could be hidden behind a config option or runtime option. So I can't imagine to have something like this. So, so it sounds like the answer is the yes, content. implement it. Uh, <laughs> That's best. Well, and, and, well, I wonder if you actually might measure the impact because you actually measured the system, how it behaves like the next four hours. And I think that if there is some impact on the performance, you would see it in, in the output. So yeah, I was going to say, um, Sorry. Yeah. For recent changes to the way call, uh, F-Trace call sites worked on ARM64, we added a bunch of benchmarks in uh, samples where you can benchmark all the different ways the patching works. We should probably get some actual data through that and see, is there an overhead? Because there's things yeah, we could do to address it. Yeah. That's Let me just yeah. uh, show the last one so we can take it offline. So we, so sometimes we have the like KLP transition errors. And what it shows is, uh, it's kind of annoying, especially when you have like many, many servers and they, they may fail different ways. So we have key patch, we'll print the stack and there's a print debug in the functions that make the decision we cannot do the transition. And, but that's kind of the, the debug is definitely two verbals. And so I was thinking some summary, maybe like at the end of like a transition failure will be really helpful when you have a million servers like making the transition, maybe 1,000 them failed. Okay. You can quick summary. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot.